I'm Mark Zimmerman. I'm a co-director of the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention, and I think I pressed the uh, green button to go, the red button to go back. Um, co-director of the uh, University of Michigan uh, Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention. I'll, I'll read it so that I don't uh, I know what I'm saying. Um, first of all, I want to say just a shout out to Brandon to say a personal thank you for uh, the touching story and the motivation about all the work that we're doing here and why we're doing this uh, and trying to make uh, a difference. And the Institute's about the Michigan difference in this process. And I think we're different than uh, every other um, really center that work that exists on uh, in, this, in the United States. There's about six or seven centers around the uh, United States uh, that focus are starting to focus on firearm violence, but um, we're the only institute. <coughs> and we, um, we focus on all aspects of, of firearm injury. You heard that uh, half, uh, over half of all firearm deaths are actually suicides, uh, there's school violence, um, there are um, uh, aspects of uh, r rural uh, suicides, urban community violence, um, mass shootings. Uh, and then we also focus on all the antecedents, the things that happened before uh, all those uh, events. Because uh, as we saw yesterday in a talk that uh, was at the Institute uh, from one of the uh, soon-to-be panel speakers, uh, it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, over 100,000 people a, uh, a year uh, are hurt and or killed by firearm uh, violence. Um, we have to do better than this. Uh, we've been able to land on the moon. Um, we're standing in the building where the Peace Corps was announced, here, right here at, um, in, uh, at, in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, the uh, announcement of the clinical trials for the polio vaccine was announced right here on uh, a building not far away from here. And I hope to someday be um, probably in the audience uh, rather than up here to say that we helped staunch the uh, epidemic uh, of firearm violence in America. And it's, it's many things. Um, so we're looking at the epidemiology, the risk and promotive factors, the, the root causes. Uh, we're looking at primary prevention, and we're looking at uh, interventions and evaluation. We have, uh, as I just spoke about, uh, the, the different aspects of um, uh, injury uh, and death, uh, ranging from suicide, school safety, mass shootings, um, and you can see on one side, and then it's sort of crossed by um, our cores, which are research and scholarship, which is where we're doing some uh, pilot projects and pre-post award work. And um, we have a training core, which includes um, training uh, diverse workforce and researchers, as well as practitioners that go out into the world to work on these areas. Uh, an implementation uh, core, which is about basically how to scale what works into the world uh, and translate it in, from the lab uh, to the community. Uh, we have policy where the next panel is, um, is focused on the evaluation of policies and, and translational research to say, well, we know what works. Uh, how do we actually make that, uh, in, put that into practice? Uh, the data and methods core that we have uh, focuses on uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, data analysis, mixed methods, research designs, uh, big data, handling big data, uh, and importantly, we have uh, the, the Institute for Social Research has the um, granddaddy of all data repositories, and we're creating a data repository of all firearm-related uh, data so that researchers from around the world and around the country can uh, use and, and look at that and, and answer questions that are generated from their own uh, heads. Um, then just in terms of the kinds of programs, and uh, my colleagues will laugh because I didn't, they know, they, they'll know that I didn't make this slide because it says impact. Uh, and I would never use the word impact. And I see Brent shaking his head. Yes, you're right. You would never use the word impact. But uh, but we've had lots of uh, effects and influences um, in 16 different communities around the state of uh, of, of Michigan. 
Uh, we have a project uh, in the UP with Cindy Ewell Foster uh, focused on uh, uh, safe storage, working with community partners from multiple sectors. Um, that pilot project that we helped fund, uh, she's a faculty member in psychiatry, is now a, a larger CDC funded project happen, working in rural areas up in uh, the UP. Um, we have um, collaborating with um, the Ideas program and Justin's, uh, with Justin's leadership, we're funding uh, a study to, with, to uh, Christy Gamerell, who I think uh, she was this morning. I don't know if she's still out there in the, somewhere in the virtual world, um, still listening, but she's leading a, a project on LBGTQ uh, plus uh, violence uh, and particular uh, gun risk and gun violence and we heard about that this morning as well. Um, we have an NIH funded project that is a coordinating center from uh, to coordinate from six different communities, one of which is right here in uh, uh, in uh, Ypsilanti uh, at EMU, but there's one in Chicago, Washington DC, uh, Arkansas, Texas, and Mississippi, and we're leading that effort as well. Um, and so there's there's several projects that we have around the country, um, and uh, and certainly in the state of Michigan. Um, I want to say a word about our training education core, especially for any students who are listening. Uh, I know I see some uh, of our postdocs here as well. Uh, we have the first ever. T32, which is a training grant from the National Institutes of Health to fund a postdoctoral program focused exclusively on firearm violence uh, injury prevention. Um, so we have the first one, and some of our postdocs I know are in the audience. I don't know if you want to raise your hand and call you out. Stephen, I see you over there, and some folks over there. Um, so we have one of the first ones devoted to uh, increasing the pipeline of researchers. We haven't been able to do, you, we've heard, we haven't been able to do a lot of research over the last 30 years, at least not from the federal government. And as that opens up, we have to f fill it up with people doing the research. People haven't developed careers. There's not very many people with my color hair uh, doing this work um, because uh, it was really sort of a, a dead end uh, career in, in many ways. And there's few exceptions to that. And we're trying to help restart that pipeline uh, and have it start flowing with more people. We've uh, funded 30 students from us across the university and across uh, levels, so if everybody we even have some high school students, but certainly undergraduates, uh, graduate students, uh, and postdoctoral scholars. And we've included um, uh, students from across campus, like the School of Business, and uh, of course the School of Public Health. School. Uh, we, we've also involved some folks from uh, Stamps, which is our art and architecture, uh, our, our uh, art school, art and design school. I want to say something about, uh, Brandon mentioned this idea of even getting the arts involved. We have several projects that we're working with the arts right now. We're working on a, um, effects of public art in, uh, in Detroit, and then we're also looking at uh, engaging kids in those public arts, like developing murals and, write, and, and then looking to see if having public art in places makes a difference in terms of creating safer places in our cities. That's building on some other work we're doing. We're working with some artists from the uh, art and, and music um, uh, schools on a project around um, raising awareness about uh, the firearm epidemic. Um, and tomorrow I'm having lunch with some folks to talk about commissioning a play. So um, what exactly that'll look like, but more to come. Because the, one of the advantages of the Institute is that we are cross campus trying to bring on, bring in, engage the, the full spectrum of scholarship and intelligence that we have on campus from multiple perspectives and multiple points of view. And when I teach my methods class, my research methods class, for example, I talk about how um, research methods is only one way of knowing. There are other ways of knowing, and one of those is through arts. And so uh, we want to certainly engage uh, every part of this campus, and the arts are included. Um, also, just want to say, and I'll, I'll stop here and let, you, let us get on to the, um, the, the substance of why we're here this afternoon, um, but I also want to just uh, say that we have um, an impact report. Patrick, I said it. I said impact report. Um, uh, 
that basically is, describes a lot of the different activities that we're uh, engaged in and involved in. And I see many people from the Institute here uh, who also work with, with folks in the School of Public Health. So I wanted to say thanks to all of you who are here, who I see. Thanks for all your work, because none of this is done without, um, as we heard earlier, without a team and, and, and multiple people doing their part to make a difference. And we can make a difference for sure. I believe that. So this report is, there, it, I don't know if the room is going to still be open, but there are, uh, is a table where you had lunch um, so you can pick up one of those reports. And then I'm just going to leave this on for a second, um, and you can take a picture of it and get access to our, uh, I presume, I didn't actually take a picture of it, but I think it's to our website, so, uh, which I have been to. And I'm old school. I actually had a piece of paper that I read from instead of something electronic. It's lighter. Um, with that in mind, I just want to introduce my, um, my co-director and colleague, um, uh, Patrick Carter, he's an uh, emergency department physician uh, and uh, co-director of the Institute. So, Patrick? Thank you, Mark. And uh, it's really great to see everyone here today. Um, I'll be the moderator for our afternoon panel, um, which is the Legislation Tightrope, Policy Solutions to Gun Violence. And it is my honor to introduce our guest panelists. So I will um, start to call them up and then come up one by one and uh, sit at the table. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Adora Aziki, who is the Fund Development Officer for the City of Detroit. Oh, there you are. Next up is Celeste Kenperwala, who is the leader of the Michigan chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. <laughs> Next up is Doug Weeb, who is a professor of epi epidemiology here at the School of Public Health and the co-director of the Data Methods Corps at the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention. And last but certainly not least, uh, April Zioli, who is an Associate Professor of Health Management and Policy at the School of Public Health and the Director of the Policy Corps at the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention. So to start, I guess I would um, ask each of you to talk a little bit about your um, how you come to this area, this field. Um, and a little bit about your roles um, uh, in helping to address the issue of firearm injury prevention. Maybe we'll start with Adora. Sure. Uh, so once again, my name is Adora Ezeke. Um, I was introduced to this space initially as a youth uh, doing community organizing and environmental justice work in the Bay Area. Um, that was my first introduction to public health um, as part of a community action uh, team in my neighborhood, and um, I was in introduced and invited into um, a really rich public health space that involved different sectors and people of different disciplines, um, most importantly driven by residents. Um, I would say that on a personal note, I'm connected to injury prevention or this area of violence. Um, as a person that witnessed it where I grew up. Um, I'm a survivor, uh, law survivor of firearm injury. And then also um, I've been impacted directly in my own personal relationships. And so uh, there's a connection and uh, a movement inside me for those reasons. Um, and just culturally, um, I come from a bicultural family. So my dad understands violence from the context of war. And my mom understands violence as a survivor, of a, as a black American, you know, with, with structural violence and the history um, of violence in this country. And so I carry that with me. And I did so through my academic journey, first in medical anthropology and then public health, but a lot of learning and a lot of living in between. Um, so I'm excited. Thank you so much for sharing that, Celeste. 
So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Celeste Camperwala. I use she, they pronouns, and I have been involved with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America for the last eight years, which I can vividly remember because I was eight months pregnant with my youngest son when I became involved, and he will be eight in a couple of weeks. And for the last two years, I have been the Michigan chapter leader of the organization. And after doing this for eight years now, I will be stepping down from leadership at the end of next week, which is very emotional for me. Um, why I got involved in the movement is because I was sick and tired of witnessing on the news on a regular basis, the horror of the epidemic of gun violence in this country. And so I wanted to do something. I wanted to make a change. And my wonderful husband went online and found Every Town for Gun Safety, which led me to my local Moms Demand Action group, which I found out in Michigan, started here in Ann Arbor. And I found myself at my first Moms Demand Action meeting writing care cards to the survivors of the Uber driver shooting in Kalamazoo, which was near and dear to my heart because I grew up on the west side of the state and my mom worked in Kalamazoo for many years. And so I was very familiar with the area. And um, so not only was I sitting there writing care cards, but I sat across from the Michigan founding uh, member of Moms in Action. And I happened to mention that my dad took his life with his firearm. It'll be 10 years this April. And she looked at me and she said, you're a survivor of gun violence. And I, I was very taken aback. I had never considered myself that. And since then, telling my story time and time again, I've found that by telling my story, I help others recognize in themselves that they too are survivors of gun violence. And so I continue to do this work day in and day out for the survivors out there and for my children. Doug Weeb here. I use he, his pronouns. Um, I'm an epidemiologist. And I got my start while during my PhD at the University of California, Irvine, I completed my dissertation in 2000 um, in the School of Social Ecology, very nice eclectic mix of criminology, public health, public policy, built environment, and saw an opportunity. I was interested in injury, interested in gun violence, in particular on the heels of publications that had come out recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, no less, with the word firearm in the title. And that was a rare thing then, and it's still too rare now. Arthur Kellerman, these emergency medicine docs, have been pioneers for a while in leading firearm research. Arthur Kellerman at Emory at the time, um, had funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, published these two papers in the New England Journal, asking the question, are firearms protective or perilous? I'm glad that we don't really think in those terms anymore. Or it's not so much a mantra. But the question was, is having a gun in the home protecting people or putting them at risk? Briefly, his studies looked at three counties and found that fire, having a firearm in the home did pose a risk. Mentors of mine pointed out the opportunity to, to replicate that study, but do so at a national level. And, and that's what we try to do. A first study to identify in epidemiology, what, what's the distribution and, and determinants of disease? And if we can figure out what's causing it, we have chances to prevent it. So I completed national studies on that question. I was hooked on the opportunity um, to make a contribution, and I was able to get my first job as a faculty person uh, with firearm injury research squarely uh, as a primary um, part of my work, and I've been able to, to, stay, to stay in that business. And I'm very interested in, in growing the next generation and happy to talk more about policy implications that we're all dealing with. I'm April Zioli. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health here and policy core director at the Institute. I came to this field from being an undergrad here at the University of Michigan. 
and looking around and seeing my girlfriends being victimized by their boyfriends. I came to this field through wanting to make a difference in the field of intimate partner violence. And the use of guns in intimate partner violence makes it much lethal, makes non-fatal consequences worse. And so I wanted to figure out how I could make a change. I, I think many of us on this panel and the next panel are people you know, who, when you pose the question, you know, or when they think something should be done about that, the next thought is, what am I going to do about that? So I went to the School of Public Health and got my master's. And then I went to Johns Hopkins, which at the time, uh, was the only place that had a center for you know, gun policy in the United States. And I got my PhD there and am so happy and fortunate to be here at the U of M where we now have an institute to prevent firearm injury. And my research focuses are domestic violence and firearms and extreme risk protection orders. Thank you all. So such great um, breadth of expertise we have on our panel today. Um, I think it's fitting, uh, given that today these new laws have just gone into effect, to maybe start there as we talk about policy. And I guess maybe, April, I'd start with you. And um, can you tell us a little bit about these new laws and how effective they are and how, how effective they've been in other states where they've been passed and mm -hmm. implemented? The three laws that go into effect today are the Extreme Risk Protection Order Law, the Child Access Prevention Law, and the Purchaser Licensing Background Check Law. The Child Access Prevention Law says that if you have a minor in your home, or you can reasonably assume that a minor will be in your home, that you have to store your gun in a way that they can't get to it. And that means secured, locked, ammunition separate. That law, of all the firearm injury prevention laws, has probably been studied-ish the most and definitely has the most evidence behind it in terms of its effectiveness in reducing childhood suicide, childhood homicide, and childhood unintentional firearm deaths. The second law is that firearm purchaser licensing law, and that says that if you're gonna buy a handgun or a long gun from a licensed dealer or a private seller, you need to get a license. You go into local authorities, they do a background check. If you pass the background check, you're going to get that license, and then you can you know, purchase the gun you wanna purchase. That law has also been associated with really good outcomes. It's been associated with reductions in homicides and suicides. It's been reductions in uh, shootings of police officers in states that have this law have fewer mass shootings. The third is that extreme risk protection order law. And this says that if a person is at risk in the near future of harming themselves or others, a law enforcement officer or a family member, intimate partner, or healthcare provider can petition the civil court to say that they can't have a gun right now, not while they're dangerous, not while they're at risk of harming themselves, not while they're at risk of harming others. And I study that law quite a lot. And we found that it is associated with reductions in suicide. And we also know that people are petitioning for extreme risk protection orders in the case of credible mass shooting threats. It's a newer law. Only four states had this before 2018, so we don't have a lot of the other you know, types of research that I might mention, like research on homicide outcomes. Uh, we don't have that yet, but the studies are in motion, so soon we'll know. Great, thank you. And um, I know just from our work in the Institute that you know not everyone has necessarily been a big fan of these laws being um, passed and put in, and I know it was a long process in the legislature. I'm wondering maybe, Adora and Celeste, from your viewpoint of working in local government, working for an advocacy organization, 
you know, what types of conversations did you have as these laws were working their way through the legislature? How did you engage with people around what the data shows that, you know, April just clearly talked about? Um, and, and how did those conversations go and how did you find common ground? Well, I would argue that any responsible gun owner would want children to be protected, would want to end gun violence. Uh, what I always say is I don't know anyone who is pro-gun violence. We are all anti-gun violence here. We're not anti-gun, we're just anti-gun violence. And one of my dear friends by the name of John Gold, he uh, used to be an NRA firearms instructor for 25 years and he has since ripped up his NRA card and he is now the, uh, or he was the Michigan president, now he is hired by Giffords, gun owners for safety, and he supports every single one of these laws that were passed, and I will tell you that the folks who were there in the hearings, and I know that my friends here can attest to this, my, um, the people who were in the hearings who were against these laws really had no sense of logic because, again, people just want to be safe. We all have a right to live just as much as people have a right to own a gun. Yes, that is your right, but it's also your responsibility. And with it is a big responsibility to make sure that those guns are safely put away. I'll let Adora take it from here. Um, it's been really interesting within local government. Um, my approach to local government work is to really stay in the neighborhood. Um, so I'm really active in a lot of coalitions, and even within fund development, I'm always thinking about um, how to leverage resources to um, make community-led interventions, you know, funded and, and activated. Um, it's it's been a spicy topic, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with um, our living experience and our lived experience connected to the issue. Um, and then also, sometimes we take on the identity of the institution we represent, um, whether it's faith-based or community or government or any other space. Um, and so personally, I exercise um, a strategy that, that's called radical listening. So just being able to suspend judgment, put on your anthropology hat, and listen to people to better understand why they have this concern. Um, I think that a lot of times we, in the public health space, can see the big picture. We see all the, the systemic issues around uh, firearm violence, but we have to understand um, what this means for someone that's just making it to tomorrow, that's just trying to survive the day, that may be working on redeeming themselves in the community that they may have harmed, um, or people that are still in the healing process. And so um, a lot of times policies can seem really far removed from the reality of people who have to go home to that issue every day. Um, and so I think that uh, what's been most effective, at least in the role that I'm in, is co-creating uh, interventions and um, really participatory grant making and design. Um, and also just recognizing that when that's not your direct experience, Lean back. Yeah. Um, you, it applies to any other system too. It's just like we have a lot of people making decisions about um, structural changes that they never had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Public services, if you've never been in the office, if you never had to apply, but you're making decisions about public resources. So it's really bringing together all the superpowers, all the genius into the space. Um, but before presenting a position, ensuring that everyone's equipped with the information to um, express what their position is, but then also be open to other uh, perspectives. And I guess that's really what data equity is too. You know, not just to present information to people to, to get them motivated to align with you, but you know, how do we share information and, and, and support people with like, leading and inventing and facilitating what data can do or what that change can do. That's really great. I love the idea of radical listening and making sure that the diverse viewpoints that are in the room and at the table are first at the table and then second are heard. 
it's easy to think when um, uh, the legislature passed these laws that were sort of, okay, we're done. Um, I guess I know, April, um, we've talked a lot about the role of implementation and the importance of that. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that in regards to these new laws. And I know you've done a lot of work on thinking about domestic violence restraining orders and implementation of those, and maybe that's a roadmap for this. Yeah, laws are just words on a piece of paper unless they're implemented properly. And you know, particularly with this extremist protection order law that went into effect today, there's a whole new system you know, that is being put into place, new petition forms, new court procedures, and most importantly, people need to know about it for it to be used. And it also needs to be, um, the implementation needs to be constructed in a way that is appropriate and acceptable to the public, or it's not going to be used. If people you know, have a father who is you know, suicidal, but they fear what will happen when law enforcement come to their house to remove the gun, they're not going to use an extreme risk protection order. And, you know, a life may be lost. So we need to get the systems in place so that the implementation, how the courts work, how law enforcement works to do these things is equitable and acceptable and appropriate. I have done a lot of work in the domestic violence restraining order space and, um, implementation there with the firearm restrictions is spotty. Some states have laws that say that if you've been restricted from firearm possession under a restraining order, that the judge is authorized to tell you that if you have any guns, you have to turn them in. Michigan doesn't have such a law. So in Michigan, when someone is prohibited from having a gun under this restraining order, that happens, the sound of silence. Um, we're working, I'm doing a study right now to find out, you know, are these guns being relinquished? Are people, you know, are law enforcement knocking on doors to get the guns or are people turning them in to um, licensed dealers? How is this working or is it working? Because again, if we don't actually implement the law, if we don't actually make sure that the person we said is too dangerous to have a gun doesn't have a gun, then we haven't safeguarded anybody. Yeah, I think that's so important to think about um, the role of implementation, of dissemination of information. I wonder, um, you know, with each of your different hats on, um, what your organizations, um, what academ academia is doing to help support that dissemination, that implementation effort. If you want to speak to that at all. That was for I, anybody. I can share what I'm doing as a community member. So I'm involved in uh, the Detroit Health Equity Council. Um, it's a collection of organizations and individuals and entrepreneurs. Um, that come together around all these different dimensions of justice and equity um, to, you know, activate this movement. Um, I think taking complex information and translating them into digestible bites will be critical. I think we've learned with everything from, for, with every emergency, that if we don't have shared language, it's going to be a bit of a challenge to have a meaningful uh, dialogue about solutions. Um, I also think that the messengers and the content creators should be just as diverse as the people that are being impacted by the issue. Um, and we also can um, encourage the general public to understand like what does this public health ecosystem mean and we all have role work and like r-o-l-e work so whatever corner whatever space or whatever area that we're committed to what are what can we do to activate change that helps with um 
I think realizing what we can do around the, the uh, firearm policies as well. Anybody else want to speak to that? Oops. Okay, uh, so one of my uh, many hats that I wear, I also help out an organization here in Michigan called End Gun Violence, and I sit on the steering committee of that. And we had a wonderful two-day session uh, just a couple of weeks ago talking about all of these laws that are going into effect and how folks can help out in their own community and make sure that we are utilizing these laws effectively. So I encourage all of you, you can go to the End Gun Violence Michigan website. There's a YouTube channel where they have put up all of the sessions that were streamed that day and it's all really helpful information to have. Other audiences for our dissemination, um, Congress, the House, even the National Institutes of Health, and you know, groups of leadership from across the country who are working at universities, other institutions with injury-interested research groups, uh, go annually to Washington, D.C. and do Hill Days. They, they meet with legislators talk about um, the kind of work that we're doing, the fact that firearm injury, other types of injury are, are the leading cause of death in the country, uh, but we have opportunities to change them. And we provide suggestions and try to meet one-on-one, -on -one, meet them where they're at, and, and communicate our findings and be optimistic about the possibilities to change policy. Even at the National Institutes of Health, you know, it, it is that that is funding this T32 training grant that Mark mentioned. Uh, that, I believe, is funded by the NICHD, National Institute on Child Health and Human Development, and rightly so. Uh, but of all of the 26 or so centers and institutes at the National Institutes of Health, there's not yet a National Institute on Firearm Injury Prevention. Um, and, and why is that? Why must we uh, go to other institutes that have related interests? Why couldn't there be uh, an institute that is squarely prioritizing firearm injury? So that too is one of the audiences for our messaging. And I'll finish up um, you know, by saying you know, I, I do research and none of you, many of you don't read academic journals. So I spend a lot of time talking to the media to say what the science is showing us, you know, what we're finding now. And if you do go to our Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention website, you'll see that we have a lot of that information on there. And also, if you look under resources, our newest addition to the website is an Extremist Protection Order Toolkit, which walks you through the steps, you know, what they are, how to do this, um, you know, what happens if someone serves an ERPO on you? you know, so that um, a wider audience can understand what's going on and is informed. That's great. And I'm going to back up a little bit and try and take a little bit of a broader um, lens on policy. And Doug, I think I was um, struck a little bit by what you said in, in, in talking about, you know, a National Institutes for Health um, focus on firearm injury prevention. And, we know there's the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for cars. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, the parallel with motor vehicle crash injury with your injury hat and injury lens on. You know, we didn't, we started at a place where motor vehicle crash death in the mid 50s was very high and we've made substantial um, strides in reducing that. And a lot of that's through the research that we've done here. And I, I um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that, those yeah. parallels. Yes, indeed. I mean, how it, it sometimes it's hard to stay optimistic in this line of work, given the magnitude of what's going on. And, and so often we quickly become isolated in what we're doing. Um, but there's great reason for optimism. Uh, as a parallel, one of the greatest public health success stories of the 20th century was the dramatic reduction in deaths in motor vehicle crashes that occurred over the last century. And you know that, that didn't just happen. That was very deliberate. For that, though, there was certainly no one-size-fits-all solution, as will be the case for firearm injury. Pat just mentioned NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. It was 1966 when that 
um, had its first director. This was Dr. Bill Haddon. He'd been at MIT, Harvard School of Medicine, Harvard School of Public Health, first director. He was charged with coming up with safety standards for motor vehicles and, and for roadways and the whole transportation infrastructure. He also challenged us to be more scientific and strategic about injury prevention there for motor vehicle crash. And it, briefly, um, one thing that you learn about quickly when you start doing this kind of work in injury prevention and public health is the Haddon matrix, named after Bill Haddon. Imagine, we can prevent injuries of any type, motor vehicle crash, firearm, by working before the event even happens, that's ideal. If the event happens, there are steps we can take. After the event, the event happens, if you keep someone alive, decrease, decrease the burden of long-term outcomes, negative outcomes. This is primary, secondary, and tertiary public health prevention. What levers can we pull? Well, there are many. We can work on the individual, you and me, the driver, the gun owner, the community member. We can also work on the vector, that's the motor vehicle or the gun itself. And we can work on the built environment and the social environment. Motor vehicle crash happens, it's horrific. Get that person to a level one trauma center within an hour and you greatly increase their chances of surviving. That is one cell in the Haddon matrix where we've been working hard to be in the right position. Um, the car crash happens, what's secondary prevention? If a seat belt is on, if there's a collapsible steering column, if there's an airbag, you greatly reduce the risk of bodily harm. Um, and, and even primary prevention, driver education for one. When you're driving down the highway in California, you feel the bump, 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 bump. Those are bots dots. Bots was a person. Um, when you hit those bots dots and you realize that you're getting out of your lane, you wheel back. In Michigan, we got snow plows, bots, dots won't do. But on the side of the road where there are indentations and you feel them when you go to the right, gunk, 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 that's a deliberate public health intervention. So there are many ways that little by little, we can pull different levers that will add up uh, to prevention. So we're greatly inspired by what's been done for motor vehicle crash prevention. And I love that comparison. I think the other part of that comparison that's really important is the role of advocacy groups. And I think about Mothers Against Drunk Driving and their role in reducing uh, blood alcohol content levels around the country. And I wonder, um, Celeste, maybe if you could speak to you know, the role of advocacy organizations in this space and how that interfaces with you know, the data and research people that are in academia and how you might use that information and that data in, a, in order to help advance some of the, the potential solutions in the policy space. Absolutely. Well, I can say that Moms in Action was actually founded uh, kind of um, using inspiration from Mothers Against Drunk Driving because the our founding uh, mother, Shannon Watts, she founded Moms in Action the day after the Sandy Hook shooting took place in 2012. And I will never forget that date either because I had just found out two days prior to that on 12-12-12, I thought it was such an auspicious date that I was pregnant with my firstborn son. And then two days later was this horrific shooting, um, killing 20 first graders and six educators. And I just remember thinking, how can I bring a child into this world? Um, and so I, um, it took me a couple of years to get involved because I was, you know, in that, that newborn phase for, for a couple of years, um, having two kids two and a half years apart. Um, but the advocacy work that we do is so important. And I would argue, actually, I am not a data-driven person. You give me a statistic and it quickly goes out of my head because I am not numbers-oriented. But what I will say is that people may forget what you said. You know, this is obviously my Angelou quote. Um, you know, people may forget what you said, but they will um, never forget the way that you made them feel. And so it's so important that we tell our stories. And that's why I tell my story. I became a survivor fellow for the organization in 2018 and told my story of uh, my dad's gun death 
uh, for, uh, and I, I still do, but I was a survivor fellow for a couple of years. And so uh, the advocacy that I do, I, I love what Brandon spoke about earlier and uh, knowing who all of your local leaders are, not just people who are on the state level or on the national level, but even going to city council meetings, talking to your elected officials, it makes such a difference and telling your personal story because I just read, I did read a stat the other day that I do remember because it was uh, close to 100% of Americans know somebody who has been impacted by gun violence. And that to me speaks volumes. The importance of personal stories and the married with the data I think is really key. Um, you know, I'm struck you, Doug, talked a lot about the Hayden matrix and thinking about that two by two configuration, which allows us to broaden our um, our conceptualization of, of where to where to ad address the issue of firearm violence um, beyond an individual, thinking about some of those structural factors that may be at play. I also know that um, some other of the researchers in our field have, have started to think about a third dimension to that Hayden matrix that really thinks about how um, community is centered in that conversation and the role of equity. And I wonder, Adora, if you could talk a little bit about that. I think you already started to, to address that issue earlier in centering those community voices and those policy discussions and thinking about some of those structural factors at that, at that level from your role in local government. I think, um, so the three things come to mind. One, the power of photo voice. And for those that are in the qualitative research, um, you're probably familiar with that um, approach where you use photography to tell a story, to advocate for policy or policy change, or to drive a social issue. Um, even in my youth and then as an adult in education or in public health spaces, um, we use photo voice to make changes on the neighborhood level that became a model for things that um, were changed citywide. So something as simple as uh, doing a photo voice project about the impact of predatory marketing or um, recreational um, dispensaries right in your neighborhood and what that means to the people living there and then presenting that up to council or up to your local uh, leaders that does make uh, a ripple effect and impact and, and inspire other people to um, take a, a direction or take that direction um, the two other areas and I, I would call them big p policies resilience policies and then behavioral health equity policies so resilience policies, that's one of my favorite um, approaches because you're thinking about prevention, um, preparedness, mitigation, recovery, and you're dedicating resources, public resources to um, interventions that are meaningful and make sense for that community. We know like depending on the type or dimension of violence or um, what firearm uh, violence is connected to more broadly, um, that whatever resiliency can look different in every community. And so I'm excited about the potential of that. It could be a climate equity direction and sustainability direction, or it could be um, that we have hubs in our neighborhood where people can go for relief. And I think that just ties back to the behavioral health equity policies. Um, and so it's, it's similar to health equity, right? Having the information and the resources to make an informed decision and then having access despite who you are, the conditions you're in and who you represent. Um, but within behavioral health, a lot of times we get so clinical, right? It's like, okay, we'll have a um, school psychologist and that is helpful. However, what's responsive or I should say culturally responsive? What are people who are surviving it, living it or moving through it, requesting. So some of the most innovative um, actions would be things like putting a music studio inside a recreation center, having a culinary arts program in public schools or in a neighborhood setting, um, expressive arts programs, theater, you know? So when you combine like resilience policies with behavioral health equity policies, you can start designing solutions that support people with healing and then also um, 
designing ways that we can prevent things from happening. Um, and and I, I would say that I'm most excited about what this generation is coming up with, right? Um, a lot of times we try to decide what healing looks like. I would love to see, maybe through behavioral health equity policy, where you could go and connect with mental health or substance use services the same way that you could take a spin class. You know, when, hopefully we'll get to a point where um, wellness isn't uh, a business. Mm -hmm. Thinking about not just big policy, big P policy, but small P policy too. Um, I think April, this next question is, um, is really around, um, you know, we know there are a lot of challenges in moving federal policy forward um, at a national level. I'm curious, um, where's the art of the possible here? And where's the moonshot? What's, where should we be looking next? I think one policy that is possible, it's, it's been talked about in the federal halls before, is having everyone who buys a gun have to get a background check. So I would love to see Congress pass a purchaser licensing law similar to the one Michigan just passed. For those of you who've been in Michigan for a while, um, you may not know that in many other states, you can buy a gun from a private citizen, which could be, you know, someone who you know, has 20 guns to sell and is on the internet or you know, whomever else, your neighbor or whatever, you can do that without a background check in most states. So if someone is under an extremist protection order here in Michigan or otherwise prevented from purchasing a gun here in Michigan, they can drive the half hour to Ohio and buy from a private seller without a background check. And the private seller won't ask them, you know, are, are you legal to have a gun? And they won't tell them and the, and, and the purchase will go through because we don't have that federal policy. If we had that federal policy, we would be better able to prevent people who we've said can't have guns. We've decided as a, society, as a society are too dangerous at this moment to have a gun. Um, I lost my way in that sentence, but you know, we, we need a way to do that. And this law provides that avenue. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the research on it suggests that it saves lives. That's the one that I would uh, go for immediately. And as I said, there have been bills. We just haven't had them pass yet. I, I think maybe we will one day. The next question, um, I think it's for Doug and April. Um, you know, uh, you both spoke a little bit earlier about, um, Doug, especially when you did your intro a little bit about, you know, the impact of the lack of funding for research and, uh, and that's impact on, you know, your ability to carry forward the research you started earlier in your career. I wonder if both of you could speak a little bit about your journey as researchers and how the fluctuations in, in you know, sort of federal funding have impacted that. And, you know, the recent decision to invest in and fund firearm research and what you think that means for the students and the trainees in the room who, who want to go into this area as a, as a field to do policy, to do epidemiology research. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Your timing is good. It's, so good. <laughs> it's a good time to invest, and the world is going to invest in you if you're getting started and working in this area. I'm so lucky that mentors invested in me, but this was in 2000 at a time when I described one of my inspirations was this paper, case control study of guns in the home, are they protective or perilous? That being funded by the CDC, it was when the findings of that study were published that there was a major outcry from the National Rifle uh, Association in particular that went to the CDC and, and said, how on earth could you be funding research that did this? 
Now, this is very nuanced wording that was used, but what came to be passed was essentially a moratorium on, on federal funding for firearm-related research. Now, it could still be given, but such was the threat that the CDC wouldn't go there. I'm almost speaking out of turn when I say, I, I believe I heard it said at the CDC, they couldn't use the F word uh, b because the clampdown was so hard. Um, well, I got lucky enough to get hired at an institution where um, they said, welcome to this place. If you want to stay here, get a big grant. <laughs> what, does that feel lucky? Um, I, I, ha I had mentors that had done the same thing and said that there's a formula for this. In particular, there was a trauma surgeon and a trauma nurse, Bill Schwab, Terry Richmond, who were tired of taking bullets out of people. They hired their first epidemiologist, that's Charlie Brannis, who you'll be hearing from. And then they also hired me. But this was in the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where that's just how it worked. You wanted to get a job there, you came in with a grant, you wanted to stay there, you got way more. And you also had impact. And everyone in the School of Medicine, HIV, tuberculosis, cancer, they were applying to the National Institutes of Health. And so did we. We applied. There is no National Institute on Firearm Injury, as I said, but we still applied. We got lucky. We were funded and, and we were able to start working and stay working in this area. A way to do it is to have a team around you. All of us there had 95% soft money. You basically had to raise your money yourself, even if you got tenure. But it's possible if you're working with a group where everyone's working on related things and it, and it can all add up. Now that was super rare that we came to work that way. It was much more common that even trainees coming out of programs wouldn't dare think about studying firearms because it was understood there just isn't, isn't funding in this area. So that's why 20 plus years now ahead where federal agencies are putting out calls for proposals, talking about firearms, it is very exciting. But it's such a shame that our pool of investigators isn't bigger today. And it's because of how, how challenging it's been. Yeah, April, April had an interesting path as well. Yeah, when I didn't, when I decided to study firearm injury prevention, I didn't know there wasn't funding. Um, Good. So you know, uh, it, you know I, I went to Johns Hopkins, and they helped me craft a proposal for funding for my dissertation on intimate partner homicide that looked at domestic violence related firearm laws but we also looked at alcohol related policies and police staffing levels and so it was called something like state policies and intimate partner homicide yeah, and, and it got funded and so that started me on my way three months after I finished my PhD, so I'm a brand new baby PhD, a letter in Congress appears. <laughs> a letter sent to the head of NIH demanding to know why my and four other studies had been funded, mm -hmm. given that they involved firearms. Mm -hmm. And that sent me, <laughs> I'm, I was upset and, and scared and didn't submit for another federal grant for a while. And, and there weren't federal calls for firearm violence stuff. So it's not like I was passing up opportunities. But I found foundation funding. You know, there are foundations that have been funding firearm related uh, research for a long time, like the Joyce Foundation. And they carried me through until we finally got some funding in the federal government. And I tell you, when those calls came out, it felt like Christmas. It was such an opportunity to answer the questions that people have been asking me over and over and over again. And every single time I've had to say, I don't know, no one studied that yet. Now we can study that. And April, can, can I just say thank you for hanging in there? And like, you know, listen, listen to what we heard. It's essentially, can I say that you felt kind of the bullying yeah. effect? Mm -hmm. How tragic that professionally you realized you'd touched a live wire 
and you didn't even want to go there. Yeah. I, how wrong is that? You know, kudos if I have the timing right to the then the to the then director of the National Institutes of Health, who wrote a letter in response to that and said, "Nope, a bullet enters your body, you bleed. That's not good for your health." We're the National Institutes mm -hmm. of Health, mm -hmm. and and that's what he said. S still. Um, there's no National Institute of Fire Injury Prevention, but good for you for going back for funding, uh, and we're going to keep on on working on this. So, just on that note, what what does the new funding? What is um, this new institute here? The Ideas Initiative and the School of Public Health, and all the folks who are focused on this. What does that mean for our future trainees out in the out in the audience? I. It, it, to reiterate what, what Doug said, this is a really, really fantastic time you know, to be in this field. There are funding calls every year. There isn't a sign that they're going away. I don't think they'll go away. We've made a big cultural shift in this country. People talk about cultural shifts being slow, and I guess they are, but I'm old enough that I've seen a lot of them. And you know, so funding for firearm-related violence prevention is here to stay. Our institute is here to train you if you want to be a researcher in this area. And we need more researchers in this area. There are a lot of questions that we don't have the answers to. And we're happy to work with you to find out the answers. So um, as we wrap up here, I wonder, um, in all of the conversation we've had today, the new laws in Michigan, the broader policy that can be advanced, the small p policy, what, what do you want to leave the audience with? What are you hopeful about? What are you looking for in the future? What, what are those future conversations about? And I guess I would ask each person to provide their viewpoint on that. Wow, I'm still hanging on uh, April's words. Um, I, I think my final thought is when we shake the table through whatever space that we're moving the needle and we get pushed back for advancing equity, then we're probably in the right space or we're, we're probably on track. Um, I think anytime whatever big I is like big institution or whatever that power system or positional power person or group. Um, a lot of times they're afraid of accountability, especially when accountability can be billable, right? And so uh, with firearm violence or with racism or any other form of uh, structural and systemic and multi generational oppression and discrimination. The moment we start understanding and providing the receipts for why we have to move this work forward or move this movement forward, um, I think that's the exciting part, but also the chilling part. You know, you, you would think we were all in it together, but um, I think I think that's what it really is. And then maybe shared ownership. So just ensuring that. Uh, when we're thinking about addressing institutional or economic or environmental or social structures and factors that um, we're passing on and creating space for um, people to, to design their path to liberation, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's totally okay for people to decide how to get things done. We, we don't have to micromanage people's freedom, people's safety, people's peace, um, as long as we're able to respect everyone while we're activating that change, so. That's great. So. I love that. I'm just so humbled to be here amongst these incredible people. Uh, I would I would borrow some words from our founding mother Shannon Watts, and that is that it drips on a rock. It takes a lot of time. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And I do both. Um, <laughs> and um, I would just I would say that folks who are against uh, gun violence prevention and gun safety are on the wrong side of history. 
you know, I'm, I'm inspired by, by thinking that um, I'm no longer worried that some of our predecessors in the field were having delusions of grandeur when they said firearm injury prevention should be um, part and parcel of, of federal policy and, and, the, and the way the country works. And indeed, you know, Brandon said, there is an appetite for this. And no matter where you're coming from, uh, the, the fact that community safety is a priority for everyone brings us all together. Colleagues in this field have been saying for a while, there could be, should be an office at the federal level, house it in the cabinet of the president, have the, have the individual who's the director be, be on the president's cabinet, and have a national office for firearm injury prevention. Already, many municipalities, counties, Milwaukee, in fact, New York City, have an auspice on gun violence prevention. Some states do, like Connecticut. But we need an opportunity and a structure for bi-directional communication, local, regional, national, um, and to make a statement that we're going to take this on. We all want firearm injury uh, prevention um, to be achieved, and we need to build that into our structures. Need to find a way to finding, find funding opportunities from entities that are already out there. Um, communicate the message that, that this is the, the new now um, and, and we're ready for it. So I've, I think that the time is right to actually say we can get there now. I agree. I, th I think we can get there now. And you know, to bring in a, a little bit more to that, one of the things that people ask me about a lot, particularly you know, when these bills were in you know, the Michigan House and Senate, was about how these bills affect racial equity in firearm deaths. And you know, how can we implement them in a way that is equitable, that is without bias? And it is really encouraging that people are asking those questions. It is really encouraging that we're starting, um, you know, I don't want to say starting, but more than any point in my career, you know, have I seen people um, you know, holding my feet to the fire as a researcher over that. How are you going to measure this? Mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to make sure that you're getting the right voices in your community groups? How are, how are you going to make sure that extremist protection orders are um, not implemented, uh, you know, as as a way to further penalize black communities. You know, how how are you going to do this? And you know, so we know that firearm homicide is greatest in black communities. Young black men are killed at far, far and away, you know, the highest rate in this country. And you know the other area I study the most, intimate partner homicide, black women are killed at much higher rates than white women. The only group that might be a little higher is indigenous women. And you know, so we do need to think about you know, racial equity more than academia, more than systems you know, have in the past. And, and I think we're at a place where we're committed to doing that. Well, I think we should maybe leave it on that note. And I would ask the audience to please give our panelists <laughs>